Good evening, Facebook family. Welcome to another Sunday evening session with Brian and Janice. We're so delighted to join to come in to you today from your homes or wherever you may be. Um, I just hope that we find that you've had a blessed and wonderful weekend. And looking forward to you having a blessed segment from this show, being enlightened with great information, and also having a great week. Today we're going to address some issues that concern our society today. One of the things that we look at, we look at the character. You know, a lot of what's going on in our society, how we as African Americans are being deemed as, um, especially our young black men being deemed as belligerent or violent and things of that nature. But what we want to address is the issues that have gotten us where we are today. If we can bring a little of that into perspective and also what can we do as a nation, as a people, African-American people, to help channel some of that negative energy, those negative thoughts that are spit out there on us, and just bring everything into a closer perspective for us today. All mm -hmm. right? Yes, yeah, so we'll, we will just begin by um, discussing the issue that you brought up as it relates to character. Uh, what does it mean to, to really have character? How is character defined? What is the essence of character? Uh, the actual, uh, from a perspective of tradition, mm -hmm. culture, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so when we look at some of the things that young black men uh, deal with today, especially from a standpoint of uh, society as it relates to uh, having to uh, face systemic racism, concerning the system of the penal, the penal system, mm -hmm. um, also the education system. Uh, and we know that black women have some of the same challenges. Yes, we do. But not on the same dynamic as black men. Right. I think one thing that we have to look at and we have to uh, consider when it comes to black men is the environment that produced what we now know as the black male that is being maligned, uh, that is being, you know, just really uh, looked at as a beastly type of person, a beastly type of being, um, someone that is still marginalized uh, in society, someone that is looked upon uh, in a caste system and in a class system as the lowest of all human beings. So when we look at that, uh, that goes back to some of the historical concepts that actually shaped the environment that black men exist in today. So when we look at a country that was formed based off of violence mm -hmm. as it relates to the way the country came into existence by nature of war and revolt, uh, when we look at those things, when we look at uh, the tyranny that was subjected upon the subjects and from that tyranny produced rebellion, we see that some of those same character, what you talked about, character traits, traits. Yes. were actually transferred to the slave and imposed on the slave. So what do I mean when I say that? So the same tyrannical uh, type of, I guess you would say, uh, the, the same type of tactics right, that, were, that were used as it relates to the so-called patriots, those tactics were transferred from the patriot to the slave. Okay. When we look at that, that proposed a lot of problems for the black male. Uh, number one is the black male was only looked at as an animal, an basically. Animal. Yes. Yeah. They and, and that's just put an it animal without a tail. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that's what they 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 the term that was used yes. in the uh, early explorers' definition of Africans. They stated that. Uh, these people were beastly people, and literally that they were apes without a tail that walked upright. But let's get back to the black man. So when you look at the character of the black man, when you look at the environment of, that the black man uh, had to actually uh, tolerate yes. and endure as 
a subject of brutality, a subject of violence. That was transferred to the black man. So when we see today young black men acting out, when we see young black men uh, conducting themselves without being able to reason with one another, mm -hmm. without being able to rationalize and to make good choices, that is a byproduct of the actual history of the violence and the environment that the black man was not only conditioned in, but was produced in. So this country produced a certain type of man as it relates to the black man. When you have a black man that you purposely separate from his family, that you challenge as it relates to protecting his family, and then if he rose up, you uh, mutilate, you beat into submission until he's at a point of literally giving up. That is what the society at that time produced as relates to black men. And that was transferred from one generation to the next generation. So you produce, they produced a black man that did not want to jeopardize his family being hurt or harmed. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the black male would run away without taking the family because he understood that the family, if I put them in danger, they may not make it. Yes. So the hopes were to be able to get away free and to come back. A lot of times that did not happen. happen. Absolutely. So the, the fate of the black male, uh, not only did he put himself in danger, but a lot of times he would not survive. So there were a lot of conditions, yes. is what we're saying, underlying conditions that shaped what we know today as black men. So when we see black men not being responsible, when we see the violence in our community as it relates to black males, mm -hmm. they are simply acting out what was actually engineered in them and what was assimilated into them by way of slavery, by way of the environment that their ancestors were put in and what they produced from that. So that generational type of stigma carried on into the children and it produced itself over and over and over. So now what you have is a black male that doesn't quite understand how to exist in society. So he rebels to society. Yes, he does. One way that he rebels when he has a sit, let me give you an example. Let's just kind of break it down, make it elementary. Let's look at the school system. Okay. When you have teachers that have a child that comes in that is automatically labeled ADHD or ADD. Mm -hmm. When that child is labeled, at that point, the teacher pretty much has a grade on this child before he even sits down. That this is going to be a problem child, or this is a child with a disability, or this is a child with a learning impairment. That child is already stigmatized by way of being coded. So what I call that is by way of being classified as a laborer in a system that cannot be educated. So when you go back to the system of slavery, part of that system said that Africans were not allowed to be educated. If any white was taught educating African people, they were fined a hundred dollars and also given 30 lashes. So the whole concept of education relating to specifically the black man was denied. So when that child is put in that classroom labeled ADHD, ADD, and I know we have educators that watch, there is a card, what I call a card, like I said, classifying that young man already as a problem. So now he's put in a caste system. And that caste system says that this child is not able to learn the way everybody else learned so that we have to now alter his 
education, we have to alter the way we teach him because we can't teach him like all other children because he's not normal like all other children. Wow. So now you take away the normality of the child, you denormalize him, and now you make him no more than a brute that's trying to learn this system, this educational system, this subject, whatever it may be, the subject matter, mm -hmm. he's at a disadvantage because we've labeled him abnormal. We labeled him the ape without the tail. We have labeled him the field Negro that it has, has been uh, designated as unteachable, unlearnable. So we, now we have stigmatized that young male without even trying. Now we have formed and developed an opinion about this child without even knowing the environment that the child, that, that produced this child. So when that child sits down, he is already labeled behind the eight ball. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Now he acts out as a rebuttal to that as one that refuses to learn. So guess what? You label me ADHD, you label me, and even if he does have some hyperactivity, okay, <laughs> if we treat him as a problem, he's going to produce problematic behavior. characteristics and behavior. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So now that child begins to act out in defense. Mm -hmm of himself and the best way to act out in defense of myself when you label me one way is to act like you label me even if I'm not that I may be a brilliant young child but yet because you're treating me abnormal and you've labeled me and you refuse to learn uh, how to educate me as it relates to my disability which is an ability to learn differently that's what a disability is yes. It is an ability to learn differently. So you take the D-I from different and you put it D-I-S in ability and that's what you have. You have a child that has ability just like every other child. He just learns differently. Yes. <laughs> okay. So if we would approach it that way and see that child normal just like all other children mm -hmm. but just learns differently. Yes then we could treat that child with the same dignity, the same respect. Uh, we understand that at that moment, we could teach that child without denying him the same methods of learning that we give other children. Yes. So now we're producing a young man that says, I may be a little bit hyper, but I have a community that understands that my hyperactivity, hyperactivity does not limit my learning ability. <laughs> and I can learn just as well as any other child in the classroom. When that type of humanity is given to the child, the child will respond to that in a positive manner. Yes. So what we have is a system that has diametrically opposed black men because of the environment that slavery stigmatized and labeled us as concerning the caste system mm -hmm. that was created for us to be on the bottom of all species as it relates to the human family. And not only that, they put us in a class system, which was to be the less educated of all of the human species and human family by denying black men proper education. So we could deal with the women uh, as the it relates to, yes. yes. yes and, and I wanna deal with that because I wanna show why also women respond the way they respond now to the black male as it relates to the environment that produced them by way of enslavement and by way of some of the same uh, tactics that engineered, the same brutality that engineered, the same terrorism that engineered the black male, 
also engineered the black woman. The only difference is, is the thinking and the maturity process that goes along with the consciousness of different roles as a male, female, and how those roles were twisted for us to be divided against one another. But so what you see today is the black man, sweetie, acting out and operating up under the conditions of the environment that shaped him. So if violence shaped him, if terrorism shaped him, mm -hmm. if brutality shaped him, mm -hmm. then he cannot produce but what shaped him. So now, when we look at black on black crime, statistically, in me being a data person, data certified and scientist, so they say, <laughs> Just to let you all know my background, I love data. Yes. So statistically, data says that there are more white on white crimes that are committed yearly than there are black on black crimes. But the propaganda machine known as the media and the news do not report those acts of violence as it relates to any other ethnicity because they want to continue to portray the black man as beastly, violent, vulgar. They want to continue to demean the black man so that he has less standing within the family structure, less standing within society, less standing within a community. So they want to continue to promote the black man as something that should be abhorred. And therefore you have the emasculation of the black man. You have the black man now being uh, reduced to no more than tendencies of a woman, okay? And the promotion of black men being more acceptable if they are uh, have female character traits, mm -hmm. female tendencies, mm -hmm. if they take on a female nature. Mm -hmm. Society does not want to see a black alpha male. They prefer the beta males. Yes. Okay. They prefer the males that are passive, that will not stand up for family, that will not stand up for discipline, that does not have character, that will not stand up for character, that will not produce young boys of the same type of morality and standards so that the black family continues to be diminished. Yes. Okay. And in society, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we have to, I think, as African people, we have to think differently as it relates to black men and what we see with our black men every day. We have to understand that a lot of what we see behavioral is a byproduct of the environment that shaped them based on the environment of their ancestors that was passed down from generation to generation to generation. Okay. okay. So I'll let you. Well, you know, Brian, a lot of what we're hearing, you know, uh, women are saying that, you know, a lot of the men are not ready. You know, they're not, they don't mature. We know that they don't, a lot of men don't mature as fast as women. Mm -hmm. You know, with, there's some delayment there in age wise of maturity, chronological mm -hmm. age. Of maturity so we we look at that and say well you know they need to hold support the black women support their families mm -hmm. so, you know be there for their family don't run out on responsibility don't run from responsibility stand up for what's right do the right thing you know they grow up hearing this a lot of them but for some reason they still deter from that mm -hmm. I, I would agree that uh, you know that there's a percentage of black young black men that grow up with positive images in their home. Yes. Positive images as it relates to parents. In the community okay? as well. In the community, they mm -hmm. grow up with positive images. Um, so I would agree with that. That's where I go back to looking at the environment. Once they leave that particular safe place, if you will, Okay. When they leave that safe place, they enter into a different environment that is brutal toward black men by way of 
Whether you, let's look at it, this another situation. We can look at the police brutality. Yes, definitely. When you're a young black man that you raised to be an upstanding citizen yes. leaves home, whether it be for college, whether it be to work, he's now put in a whole different environment. He's put in an environment that now despises him. So therefore, now he has to deal with police brutality, regardless of the outstanding Young images yes. that he grew up with, yes. regardless of the images in uh, the community, things of that nature. So what we have to do is continue to educate our black men that you still have to go out into a society that does not favor you as a young man, okay? You still have to go into an environment that has been systematically pitted against you. How do you now deal with that? How do we translate teaching him how to be a productive citizen, teaching him how to be productive in society when he now has to be thrust into an environment yes that does not consider him a citizen, mm -hmm. that does not consider him part of this society, that does not consider him as an outstanding individual, okay? What they, and, and, and when you look at that, what it now says to the young black man is regardless of how much mama, daddy, uncle, cousin, the community, how upstanding the community was, my parents was, and what I've tried to fashion my life is now I got to deal with the brutality of the system. Yes. Now the system begins to reshape his thinking. Okay. There's a doctor uh, in New York. He gives a testimony. His son went to the best Ivy League school that money could put you through. Okay. His son grew up. Uh, father was a lawyer. Mother was a lawyer grew up in an environment where they did not espouse racism, grew up in an environment where they, they very rarely addressed uh, any racial tensions as it relates to white people, taught him to respect whites, taught him to respect Asians, taught him to respect Hispanics, taught him to respect all people, yeah. good loving family. When he went off to college, to this Ivy League school, and doctor, his last name is Johnson. He wrote in his book, the experience of his son. When he got to the Ivy League school and the young man began to mingle with some of the whites there, the white kids began to uh, malign him, to viciously attack him verbally, began to call him the N-word openly, and that he was just a privileged in from a well-to-do family and he should not have been there because that school wasn't created for him. He then had another experience where the campus police pulled him over and asked him what he was doing on that, uh, that campus. <laughs> okay, and, and the young man was distraught. He went back to his father and he said, Daddy, why? Did they do that to me? I did nothing to them. And his father now had to introduce him to the reality of what society was and how it viewed black people. See, he had to go now beyond just being a black man, but how society viewed black people, okay? And we're not saying that all whites look at black people in that stigma or with that type of, uh, you know, under that type of eye of scrutiny. Mm -hmm. But what we are saying is that a system that has been created yes. for racism to thrive and to survive over the centuries and far beyond the centuries that we are now in is still alive and well. And after uh, Dr. Johnson began to explain to his son and what was happening. His son took a whole different approach from that point about the college he was attending and the life that he wanted to live now as a black man. Okay? Not only broke the daddy's heart, 
but shattered the son's depiction of what he thought was a society that where everybody loved everybody and everybody wanted good for everybody and everybody looked at each other as equal. And unfortunately, that is not the case and never has been the case. Okay, so I can go back to 14th, 15th century when slaves started to be imported, imported to the Americas via the Portugal and Spain slave trade. We could talk about that and we can talk about those early explorers that well documented how they looked at African people. They looked at them as beastly, hypersexual. We talked about yes. this as very vulgar, unclean, unmoral, immoral uh, type of people. And based off of those writings that moved from one century to the next, moved from Portugal to Spain, to Britain, to France, to Italy, it shaped the way all of those explorers that would participate in the slave trade, how they viewed African people. So now the system had been created as it relates to a people that were dysfunctional because of their color, because of the way they looked, because of the way they acted as it relates to their culture, which was a beautiful culture, but a denied culture. You understand? Yes. So all of these things, there again, are products of the environment that have shaped our young black men. Uh, so does there need to be a, a, a reteaching? Yes. You know, do we need to, is there a revolution that needs to happen as it relates to uh, black men and how yes. we treat one another and, yes. and, and how we communicate with one yes. another? Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Okay. Is there a revolution that needs to take place as it relates to how the black man treat his black woman yes. and his child? Absolutely. But until the black man deal with his own ills and take an inventory of self and began to view himself differently from the image that was painted mm. historically, he is going to always have a problem as it relates to understanding how to function in a system, in a society that is pitted against him, that has been set up uh, to oppose him and to oppose everything that is good and decent about yes. him. Yes. Okay. So we as, as black men, I, and I'm, I'm a black man. So my black experience as a man uh, is drastically different from my colleagues that are opposite of me. Yes. Um, you know, my educational experience is quite different from my colleagues that were privileged to come into the college and didn't have to work three jobs to put themselves through school like I did. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Even with a GI Bill, uh, there were still some things that I had to do, you understand, to take care of myself. So I have a different experience than the European, than the Asian, than the Arab, than the Eastern Indian, the Western Indian that's immigrated over to the United States and come in and can receive all types of monies to get educated, to get yes. an education visa and come here to go to school free and all of those things. My experience was quite different. And then on top of that, I had to deal with the whole concept of learning a system that was uh, put in place for me not to thrive in. I had to be better and smarter than all of my counterparts in my business courses. I had to be better and smarter in my finances, my courses of finance and accounting, all of those things. And quite naturally, being a black male, yes. um, my experience learning with certain things came second nature. Mathematics came second nature. So I was always good when it came to all of those things, but it was still different. And I could see the favoritism regardless of my brilliance, I could still see the favoritism, okay? But what could not be denied was 
in every failure that I had, I used it to promote my success. You understand? So I built off of the fact that nobody could learn better than I could and that that self-image of who I was as a young man and the self-image now as a man says that I am all that my community needs. And it said that when I was in school and it says that Every day now, when I go to work, when I'm not at work, when I'm, we're together, yes. we're, I mean, it says to me that you are within yourself. You are better each day that you exist. You perfect more of becoming the whole man that this system has denied you of for how many ever years you've been on this planet. So, okay. so Brian, what so, you're saying is that our our gender, our black men, need someone, especially starting with the youth, to implement programs to build their self esteem and to let them understand that they're worth and that they are somebody and that they can learn and they're not to be looked down upon and to not fear the police but respect everybody, mm -hmm. not just police but respect is due to everybody. And I think if enough of that is put in place to teach our young black men, I think they can get that. Our black men have no problem learning as it relates to teaching them basic, what I call basic uh, life skills. Okay? And that is to be humane. So we get the word human and humane shadow each other because the concept of being human is being able to produce out of yourself a character that is respectable and decent. Yes. That's where we get the word humane from. So there's an African word, okay? In the Yorubian culture, we talked about this, itutu. Itutu, yes. Which means character. It defines an individual from the source of him knowing himself, reaching deep within himself and understanding that there is no greater individual that can be produced than yourself. And when you understand the greatness of who you are, you can respect the greatness that everyone else, that is locked within everyone else, and you can respect the greatness of who everyone else is. That's exactly That's right. right. Is. Yes. Okay? So that type of character, the Itutu, that resided in our ancestors, even when they had to go through the torture of being enslaved mm. and go through the brutality of the slave master's whip. There was something that they still held on to yes. that produced in them as men, it produced something that says, this is not who I am. I'm not a slave. You understand yes. what I'm saying? So what it produced in them was a force that began to fight for liberation. Okay? So even if we teach our children, sweetheart, the best that we can, we cannot teach them the system. The system is going to give them certain lessons that you and I will not teach them in a safe place. Okay? Okay? We can educate them on how to act with police, but that does not mean that the police will treat them how we tell exactly. them they okay. should respect and treat the police. Okay. We got to understand that. See, so they're still fighting the system. The system will teach them wow. that lesson, okay? Uh, so when we look at George Floyd, when we look at the Breonna Taylors, mm -hmm. when we look at the Ahmaud Aubrey's, all of these people, we go back to the Michael Browns and the Trayvon Mars, the list go on and on and on. When we look at the brutality meted out against black men, those were lessons, regardless of them understanding that when the police comes, if, if, if they're in a situation where they have to react to the police, 
They act a certain way, but the lesson learned was that the system still rejected them when yes. they were humane. Yes. When they did nothing, nothing wrong. Yes. to deserve that type of treatment, the system mm. still went against them. That is what you cannot prepare the child for. So that is why we talk about this so much. We have to change the system. The system has to be uh, ripped apart, deconstructed, mm. and reconstructed. Okay, It has to be because the system is designed, like I said, to every day be against that young black boy, regardless of how educated he is, regardless of how good his family is, those things does not matter, okay? Now, our young men that are growing up in environments that are not productive, yes. okay? We have to reach them somehow. We cannot forget about the least of these, okay? So no child is safe until all children are safe. That is within our community. See, that is something that we have to do. We have to do that. No child left behind by Bill Clinton and lying Hillary about it takes a village to raise a child. Those are concepts. The, the village concept is actually from a tribal concept in the Congo. Yes. Okay? out of the Angolian tribes. And what that concept is, is that when an African warrior went off to battle, he would not, if he had a family, okay, the family committed to raising his child, if he had a child, because they understood if he's going off to war, he may not come back. So they automatically, before that warrior would go off into combat, everybody would come together. The whole community came together and said, if his father shall fall in combat, we will raise this child as our own. That's where Hillary steals the slogan, it takes a village to raise a child that she coined to promote and propagandize being for black people when she was never for black people. Okay, now I don't have the time to discuss Hillary. We don't want to get in politics. <laughs> but that concept is our, our concept. Ours. Yes. So what we have to do is take back, see, all of those concepts. See, and, and see, the same out of the same lips that says, you know, it takes a village to raise the child comes the slogan, super predator that these young men that are killing each other are nothing more than super predators. And we need to do something to keep them from disrupting our communities. Oh, wow. Okay, the, out of yes. the same list. Yes, yes. So if what it shows us is, is that we cannot buy into the lie and the myth that any politician wants to help our community and save our children. It is just not so. So what we have to understand okay. is that there is nothing that any politician has done as relates to, and I can go back to Lyndon B. Johnson who signed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, okay? And after that said, my stint is done. You know, I can go back to the Kennedy and all of the, the presidents, we can look at all of the senators, even some of the black senators, okay? Uh, Dr. Anderson points out in his book that with all the black senators that are in place now, there should have been in place yes. something that would correct the systemic racism against black people and that would produce a vehicle for all blacks to come up and particularly black men and with all the black senators and congressmen that we have there's nothing in place they're still debating and arguing old issues as it relates to the white community 
<laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So the, the, the police brutality laws and all of these things that we talked about briefly, that they're looking at and that they're pushing now, the agenda that they're putting, has been in place since the early 1800s. All they're doing is revising them over and over. They're not putting anything in place of any substance to really deal with the issues in the black community. We, like I said, the black male deals with more than just unfair treatment from the police. Like I said, we deal with unfair education. Yes. We deal with unfair health care. We deal unfair with all lending, of those things. Un unfair lending, All of those yes, things, the yes. practices that we deal with. Yes. So family, we have to get back to believing in ourselves, okay? Believing in our young black men again restoring them to a place to where they look within themselves. And when they look within themselves, they see the best of themselves. They don't see the least of who they are. Like society has deemed them. Absolutely. And has have tried to stigmatize them with seeing that they are the worst of humanity. We have to raise their character again itutu, and show them we want you to look within when you look within yourself you see the best that you are okay you don't see what they have shaped you to be you don't see your brother as a threat anymore you understand what i'm saying yeah. you don't see your sister your fiance your wife your girlfriend as a derogatory term, you don't see her like the system sees her. You understand? Yeah. But you see her as more than just, you see her more than just a female. You see her as your queen. You see her, not only that, as a fellow laborer of being the best that you all can be together. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So it changes the dynamic. It changes the environment that you now exist in when we began to create young men that will say, no, I want to look within myself. And it's not about right or wrong, but it's about the choice that I make as it relates to whether or not it will benefit me and all of those that are around me. See, because what's right to me could be wrong to you. So it's never about right or wrong. It's about the choice that is going to most benefit you and your family. Yes. You understand yes. that? Yes. And, and, and when, when we teach our young men to look at themselves as stewards of honor, as stewards of wisdom, stewards of knowledge and wells of information. See, when you start looking within, that's what character is. You know, character is defined by you being able to look within yourself and pull out the best, the best that you are, male or female. You understand that? When we do that, then we'll treat each other with respect as a community. Mm -hmm. Because when we see our brother, we will see ourselves, okay? That's true character. When I see myself, when I see the young man on the street with his pants hanging down, I see Brian, okay? Yeah. What I have to see in him is what I pulled out of myself, the best of who I am. So when I look at him, regardless of the state or the condition that is he, he's in, I have to see the best in him. So when I go to him to help him, I don't look down on where he is. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I raise him up from where he is. So it's a difference from looking down and raising up. I meet him where he is, I raise him up, and I teach him to look within himself to pull out the best in himself. Regardless of what the environment is, regardless of the condition that you are in, I pull out the best in you, young man. I want to teach you how to look within and to produce whatever you want in this existence. Because you are not the least. You don't serve a lesser God. You don't serve any lesser, you understand what I'm saying? You don't have any lesser gifts than anybody else. 
Let me pull out the best in you. Let me teach you how to look within yourself and pull the best thing out of you that you are. And when that comes out, nothing stops that young man. Nothing. Okay. Nothing. So there's no environment from that point that he will face that he will not be able to overcome because he will always resort to looking back in and pulling out that wisdom yes. and that understanding as relates to how to overcome where he is. So he can meet challenges. He's not afraid of challenges. See, something that slavery also produced was fear. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. It taught us to be afraid of everything as it relates to the existence in this life because this life was so brutal. Okay? So most black people, particularly black men, they want to continue to traumatize black men by putting fear, interjecting fear in them by way of police brutality, by way of the penal system, by way of the education system. It is, they are objects to continue to put fear into the black male. Once he understands how to look within and pull out that character that is the best of himself, then he can face those challenges and overcome every challenge that he faced. Yeah. Like I said, then he can make any failure his success. Then he can start producing the world that he wants to exist in. Okay? And nothing stops him from that point. Okay, so... Wow. Well, thank you guys for watching us today and thank you for joining us. And we look forward to sharing these uh, Sunday evening sessions with you. I uh, hope that you got a lot out of this. I will be sharing another watch party in about five minutes or less once we close out. But we want to wish you the best that life has to offer you and keep your head up and always look within. And Brian wants to share this word with you. It what? It tutu. It tutu. <laughs> that means it's within you. Character the from character within. from within. It tutu. it tutu. So that is something that our ancestors thrived on, and that's what they believe in, and that's what propelled them to be great mm -hmm. and to make it through those rough and hard times. Mm -hmm. So we can look within ourselves to pull out the best that's within us and to help others that are around us. So with that being said, we love you. We only wish the best for you. And if there's anything that we can do to help you, please call on us. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. We're here for you. And may God bless. Peace, family.